The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual speakers and do not represent the opinions or stance of any of the companies and organizations associated or affiliated with the speakers or this podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with Yevgeny Karam, who has decades of experience from being a cybersecurity specialist in the Israeli Navy, to working at Checkpoint Software, to becoming the VP of Cybersecurity Architecture at the Hershevik Group. We will be discussing the evolution of Zero Trust, from the beginnings of Zero Trust architecture to ZTNA, SASE, and beyond. We will also discuss how organizations can design an optimal strategy for modernizing their security architecture, taking into account constraints such as budget, staff, and the adoption of cloud infrastructure. This is the Canadian Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm your host, Damon Baer. Today, I'm joined with Evgeny Karem, who has a long and distinguished career in the cybersecurity industry. Malcolm Gladwell quoted the phrase, it takes 10,000 hours of investment in subject to become an expert in it. Evgeny has over 40,000 hours, so he's at least four times the expert. He was the VP of cybersecurity architecture for the Hershevik Group and has created multiple podcasts where he talks to the industry's leading experts and executives. Uh, Evgeny, thank you for joining today. Now, what I normally do when I have guests on the podcast is I get them to provide a bit of a background of themselves and how they got to where they are in the industry. So I'll pass over to you. If you can give me a bit of a background of how you got here, be much appreciated. Thanks. Rostel, thank you very much. Very, very happy to be here. Damon, thank you for the invitation and for the new podcast as well. You mentioned 10,000 hours or 40,000 hours. Someone calculated me and asked, like, again, it's impossible. Like, what do you mean? It is like, should take you 40 years, something like this. And we can have this joke in the industry, like dog hours, when you work for a reseller, for a VAR, for implementation, and you're doing basically integration work. You don't really work eight hours a day. You work much more, and sometimes you do long, long nights. So it's, it's quite easy or easier to get to 10,000 hours when you do weekends, nights, and not shift works, but quite a lot of hours helping customers. You asked me how I get in, into the industry. So I, I came from a bit of a different, I guess, not traditional background. I didn't join a company as an IT person and move on to security. I started in security by doing QA, quality assurance of firewalls. So I was working at Checkpoint in Israel to basically test checkpoint firewalls and I had the pleasure to test checkpoint first UTM feature of firewall it was R57 then later on will become R60 and this is one of the first basically beginning of the idea of layer 7 and integration and inspection of protocols was Palo Alto later on called next generation firewall so I had a bit of background of IT and networking before because I spent five years in the Navy where I was doing a variety of stuff. But my cybersecurity actually started in Checkpoint. So when I moved from Checkpoint from Israel to Canada in 2006, I joined Horjove Group as a firewall engineer to implement firewalls. And it was very interesting to start because I basically two weeks after I joined the work, I told here, here's the customer, go algorithm. Like what I mean, go upwards. Like, yeah, that's it. Be done. Your onboarding is done. Here's the customer. You know what you're doing. You've been working with Checkpoint for a number of years. Like, yeah, but it was in the lab. It's like, okay, so what's the difference? Create a plan. Show the customer the plan. Go execute the plan. But it's a live traffic there. What if stuff doesn't work? It's like, yeah, it's a call of risk. You need to have a good plan. You need to understand how to prepare yourself. And then you're going to lower the risk. This was the first time when I actually heard the idea of risk. It took me a number of years to actually understand that a lot of stuff in cybersecurity are risk involved or around risk, and we always calculate the risk and understand what we're trying to do. And if there is no risk, there is probably nothing happening in the company or doesn't be moving anywhere. And I spent five years, six years going between customers. Some of them are very, very big customers, like Rogers, for example, here in Canada to upgrade 
and design and architect firewalls. And as you probably know, firewalls is the first device people blame. If something doesn't work, it says it's a firewall. You guys made a change. And in many cases, it was true. In many cases, it, was, it wasn't. So it required me to learn how to prepare for work, how to understand what's involved, what protocols are running through the firewall, what applications are running through the firewall, what potentially may stop working after we're doing the change. And it checked my mind around design and architecture a lot. This was leading me to manage several teams in professional services, in Herjavy Group, network security, endpoint security, same, bit of cloud as well, and later on become the VP of architecture to do pre-sales work and design networks and security for big customers. Thank you. I appreciate the, the background. One of the main things I want to talk to you about today is zero trust. And the thing that I've come across is that zero trust seems to be a catchphrase for all sorts of things. And there's been a, a number of developments in the industry in regards to that. There's zero trust architecture, there's zero trust network access. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about zero trust architecture. And I'd like to get your take on what organizations are doing with that. Now, I find that many have not even adopted the model yet. They're still using legacy models and they may be planning for modernization or they may not be. They're just waiting for their old hardware to, to go end of life. And there's a bit of a divide on where they are and how they need to get to do modernize their infrastructure. So what do you think they should do to prioritize their efforts to modernize and, and why? So if I may, let's do a bit of step back and explain a bit like why it's important or where it's coming. The idea of zero trust means that it's not like I don't like you gain your demon, but I want to provide them access to where they need. So basically, in case I have wired access and Evgeny will find where he needs to access, I'm only going to give them access to the applications they need. If we go back 10, 15 years, majority of the company's networks, this is partially answering the question, but we'll get there as well, are flat. So there's one subnet, everybody can talk to each other. Oh, this is bad. Let's divide the network. Let's do subnetting. We'll put servers on one network, phone on a different network, users on separate network, servers on separate networks, and etc. Or maybe we even divide, this is a marketing network, sales, floors. And how are we going to do this? We're going to use a layer 3 switch, a router, basically to do this. Great, we now have subnetting, but can still you get any go and access all the devices? Yes, because there is no rules. Okay, let's put some ACLs on the router potentially. It may change something. And this is kind of what we're talking about zero trust journey because internally for the companies we're not talking about cloud yet we're talking about the life where people work in the office nobody pretty much work from home all, all the people will spend time in the office to get access can go anywhere as you want this was the beginning so actually in the beginning of my days the moment the next generation of firewall term came in where we were able to create rules based on applications and users and not just ports, we actually moved some customers and did an internal segmentation of the traffic where it says, Evgeny, you can only access these particular servers and we'll do it because we know who is Evgeny, this important part. We not just know from which IP Evgeny is coming, we know who is Evgeny. So if Evgeny moved different floors, and every floor is a different subnet, it doesn't matter because I know who is Evgeny and I will get access to Evgeny where he needs. So if Evgeny is in marketing, you'll get access to marketing servers. If Evgeny is a DBA, you will be able to get to all the, all the DB servers in the company. It requires definitely a couple of things and I'm partially answering several questions here, how you start. How do I can provide Evgeny access to DBA or database servers or the marketing servers. I need to know if they exist. So the rule of thumb in my mind, asset management, before you start your zero trust journey, 
actually in my mind, this is the beginning of any good cybersecurity program is, you know, your assets. NIST talk about this, CIS talk about this, the Center of Internet Security, and many other frameworks as well. So by creating your assets, creating your applications, you now need to, you can figure out and understand where you can access. But the zero trust doesn't stop there. We'll talk about the remote part as well a bit later. What if I need to segment server traffic? So I can have micro segmentation that the servers in the server network will not able to talk to every server in the server network. I can create a more micro segmentation where the application server will talk to the database. That part of the same application or the same app, but it will not talk to in different other servers. It will require much more surgical approach because I cannot divide every server to a different subnet, but I can do some virtual segmentation using VMware, for example, or I can put a piece of software, like almost like a mini firewall, software firewall on the server that will determine where they can connect. I don't want, I don't want to like mention vendors and brands that do this, but people are able to find this. So there's a different approach to the idea of zero trust. Internally, on the server side and on the user side, when you get out and you basically work from home or anywhere. Does this answer the question? What I'm thinking about is there's many different parts of zero trust architecture. There's you know, the network segmentation, the micro segmentation, there's the, the IM, all those different components. Each one of those has a certain cost that's associated with them. So as organizations are modernizing, they have to think, where am I going to put my money? Am I going to focus on IM first? Am I going to do micro seg, network seg? Where do you think that organizations should focus? Because we had a big shift from a hybrid environment and we work from home and also many companies moved their internal infrastructure to a cloud or even became a SaaS, I will first of all nail the idea of IAM. But by IAM, I mean who is Evgeny and where you're going to have access. It could be single sign-on, MFA, and permission to Evgeny. I think it's fundamental to any program. Unfortunately, if we look on the majority of the breaches that happened, and hacks, they happen because somebody got access to a user you're not supposed to get or privileged user. So this is almost not related to zero trust, but it is that, okay, who are you? Who, what kind of access you can have? And if you don't need access, let's remove this access. And later on, because again, we moved to SaaS, we moved to cloud, maybe less on the internal segmentation, but depending on the company, and then more on where you can get access, what you call ZTNA, Zero Trust Network Access. And it's mainly related to remote access with where we replace VPN, remote traditional VPNs. And there is a reason why the SDP, ZTNA approach is much better than traditional VPN. Okay. Now for smaller organizations that can't necessarily afford all the different layers of zero trust architecture, like maybe they, they can only afford an appliance to put on their prem environment. And then that's all that they have budget for. They can't afford micro seg. They, they can't afford anything else. Still strong that he recommend a 2FA or a MFA you know, regardless. But for the organizations that have invested in a UTM appliance, um, is that still the best sort of strategy in terms of the cost per the benefit from a security perspective? You know, as we say, it depends in, in cybersecurity. But if you are on-prem, I definitely think you need to have a UTM type next generation, whatever you want to call this device. SASE, SSE, you know, a, lot of, a lot of names right now because a lot of your infrastructure is on-prem, especially if you have devices or your manufacturing or IoT devices and you need to protect it doesn't mean if you put a device on-prem and you didn't configure it, it will do magic for you. And unfortunately, we still see this. People buy a next generation firewall with UTM capabilities, but they're not creating and configuring rules in layer seven. So buying the device by itself doesn't help. And in a way, I don't really care which device you're going to buy. It's what you're going to do with the device is more matter. You can buy a Porsche or BMW 
and still don't know how to park, put it in park. You can buy any car, for example, if you don't know how to use it correctly. So majority of the lead firewalls brand, brands right now provide similar capability. Some of them are better in one part or another, but how you configure it? Are you going to do a cell inspection? Are you going to segment the network on the firewall? It's up to you. But the moment you have the device, you can do the segmentations. Now, for users that are connecting remotely into the environment, historically what they would do is they'd use some sort of a VPN to connect in, uh, whether it's SSL VPN or a site-to-site -site VPN or something else like that, or have a device that would be in their home office that would connect them in. But that's changing now with your trust network access. Can you tell me what the difference is between ZTNA and traditional VPN are and why organizations should move to ZTNA? Definitely. And if people want to learn more as part of Security Architecture podcast, we actually have a full season about it. There's more than 15 vendors we cover in season two to show how they have this approach because there's a lot of vendors in the space. There's a couple of problems with traditional VPN, remote VPN devices, VPN aggregators, concentrators. They're usually, in most of the time, exposed to the internet because you need to connect to them. So the traffic flow is from a user to the device. And if there's a vulnerability on the device, the bad guys will be able to find it as well. Number, number of problems we saw with Juniper, Cisco, and other manufacturers in this space. Because it's exposed, it means the bad guys can do stuff with it already. So this is one of the problems. Two, when people, for example, move to work from home, we needed to quickly understand how to scale these devices as well. Because they're not unlimited, there is a physical throughput on these devices. And it's quite a problem. Third, traditionally they're designed to provide you access, and in the majority of the cases they just give you access to anywhere you want. So you connect to the environment and you can ping and map and do whatever you think you want. So they're not designed to give you access to an application, as we spoke in the beginning, the design give you access to a network. Yes, what many companies did, they will let people go in using remote VPN, they will land in the subnet, then they're gonna have a next generation firewall behind it and gonna block where you can connect. Instead of using ZTNA architecture, when it give you access to only things you need. Now, how ZTNA works, you have a device inside your company that open almost like a reverse tunnel back to the cloud and you as a user, not connecting directly to your office, you're connecting to the manufacturing cloud and there almost the two lines intersect and you can go back to the office. What does it mean? The bad guys don't know what device you have. There is no external IP. There is no vulnerability on this device because it doesn't expose. And the bad guys don't even, can, if they do a scan of your environment, they will not find any external IPs. So just the architecture part here is already superior on a different level. The other part, I'm creating rules in the cloud to where you can connect. And you can only connect these applications back to asset management to understand where you can connect. And because I'm in the cloud, I can create rules to connect to applications on-prem and also to applications into the cloud, just SaaS applications as well. So my access become much wider. Majority of them also involve other checks, like posture check, are you coming from a company device? Now, if you'll be completely honest, the Juniper, the Cisco, the Fortinet, the, the traditional remote VPNs, some of them also included these posture checks as well. But they're also included in the new architecture, and I think they're fundamentally important because I can almost do connect by design to remove the bad guys. If you are not part of my domain, if you don't have the EDR I installed, you're not able to connect. Beside the factors that you're gonna have MFA. So there's multiple checks to understand who you are. Even if I, if I capture Damon and I talk his password and username and his MFA, but I don't have his device, I'm not able to connect. So this is some of the, I think, benefits to do this. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect because it may say, oh, now I depend on the provider in the cloud. 
you are dependent probably on the cloud because if they got for bit down, then you down as well. Whereas with on-prem VPN device, you can control the SLA. The availability is very, very important. There are some other constraints there on the bandwidth part, for example. You need to understand what is the bandwidth you can put through. Do you need multiple devices internally in your network? But now we're kind of going very, very deep on the architecture and design. If anybody has questions, I'm happy to connect with them later on and explain more. Or watch the episodes. There is a lot of explanation about each vendor, how they tackle this particular problem and what they do. It's very, very interesting episodes and season or so. One of the benefits from the user perspective that I understand is that because you're not bottlenecked by a single VPN concentrator, that you actually get better performance and lower latency to access things that may be in the cloud or services on-prem using ZTNA. Yes and no. You're absolutely right. Because you're absolutely right when the company decides that they're going to force all the traffic to go back to the office. So the always on VPN, mm -hmm. as some of the vendors call it. Basically, the moment you lift you the open your device, it's connected back to the environment. And then, yes, if I'm going to go to Facebook, I'll have to go back to the office and then out of the office. So first of all, we also impact in the firewall in the office twice. You have to go in and out. And also, if your firewall or VPN concentrator located in, I don't know, California, and we are in Ontario, we have to go Canada, Ontario. We have to go all the way to California and come back if we're accessing a device here in Toronto, Canada. And if it's in the cloud, I'm going to have different pops, different locations. For the ZTNA architecture, I will be able to connect to the closest pop here in Toronto or Montreal and get access much, much faster. So you're absolutely right. Now, if the company didn't create the policy you have to be always on, then you're going directly to the website, but then there's no inspection. Yeah. This is where the other part of SASE, SSE, your filtering cloud gateways comes in. And that kind of leads into my next question is, how does ZTNA fit into the larger SASE landscape? SASE is a term also that's been kind of very popular for the last couple of years. It's a term that came to the Gardner started in 2019, August 2019, Secure Access Service Edge. And it's basically an architecture framework that incorporates ZTNA, remote access, CASB, Cloud Access Security Broker, and Security Web Gateway slash Firewall the Service, and SD-WAN. So we have three components that are security, and we have one component that is network. And ZTNA is part of the framework. Later on, in 2022, January, they released a first Gardner Magic Quadrant, and they called SSE, Secure Service Edge. And they removed the old magic quadrants for CASB and Secure Web Gateway. There was never a magic quadrant for ZTNA. So basically, they almost painted the way forward for the vendors and say, if you want to be part of the Gardner Holy Grail magic quadrant, you need to have ZTNA, CASB, and Secure Web Gateway under one umbrella called SC. Now, they kind of removed the SD WAN. That means you don't like it. It means the SD1 is more on the network side and everybody else on the security side. So SD1 is still important for people to connect to remote offices, but it's just a bit different right now. So ZTNA is definitely an important part of SASE and SSE. And I think it's important to add here, remember how we spoke that if you want to connect back to the office using ZTNA, and if you want to go to Facebook, how do you connect to Facebook? Do I go direct? Now, if I using the Secure Web Gateway, I may have rules, your own filtering rules that will tell you where and how you can connect and what you can download and upload. So it makes very logical sense to have ZTNA and Secure Web Gateway under one umbrella, under one product, and CASB as well. Like we don't want to talk about it. We don't have enough time to talk about everything. <laughs> And the reason why, because if I use Secure Web Gateway with one vendor, ZTNA with the other vendor, they're both in the cloud. Who do I go first? Where is my routing? For which one? Do I create any exceptions right now? There's a lot of problems here on the architecture side. That's why it makes total sense to use them under one umbrella. And also add DUP, malware protection, there is 
So when organizations are adopting you know, this modern approach and uh, leveraging SASE and, and ZTNA, what sort of differences should they consider whether they are fully on-prem or hybrid or 100% in the cloud as they go to implement these strategies? By Gardner, SASE, the idea is your SSE, you're actually in the cloud. So you started with the cloud. Does it mean you have to be everything in the cloud? No, you can also have an on-prem. This decision will be really, really depend on your architecture and what you're trying to achieve and the latency and potentially on your geographical location. Because if you're located in Toronto and there's a pop to go to the cloud in Toronto, then it's great. If you're located in Nunavut or somewhere very remote where there is no pop for this vendor, you need to understand how your latency will be impacted and maybe you want the infrastructure on prem because of this. So latency and where is the close pop is very important. Also, some company may have compliance requirements where they need the infrastructure on prem. Or they don't want the data to be in US, for example. They want it to be in Canada. Or some other compliance requirements where they're gonna force them to change their architecture. This is one part that's definitely definitely important. The other one is features what you're trying to get. A lot of companies jumping on this frame and say, yeah, we're going to go ZTNA, SASE, and we're going to check this vendor, this vendor, this vendor. But it's actually never created a success criteria. What do they need for their company? And this is a very important part, not just for one kind of group in the company. Talk to network security, talk to endpoint security, understand what the other groups in the company need before you go going and procuring a synthetic solution. Okay, well, thank you. It's been great talking with you today. Before we, we go, is there anything that you would want to say as a final note? First of all, thank you. I'm happy that we have many Canadian podcasts here in Canada that I started recently. I'm grateful to always talk about architecture, zero trust, SASE, SSE, and many other topics cyber related. And if you want to learn more, please find me on LinkedIn. It's quite easy to find. I know you're going to probably tag there as well. And stay safe there and have fun. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So with the help of you and me and the blessed TTC, we'll soon have a real Yes, we're gonna have a subway in Toronto. We gotta get the working man on Prado. So bear the noise with a smile, and in a little while we'll be riding in the new subway. <laughs>